السلام عليكم والسلام على نبيه ومصطفى My dear viewers, let me remind you with our phone numbers and the contact informations beginning with the area code 002-01095185170 alternatively area code 002-01005469323 and the WhatsApp numbers area code 001-347 8060025 and finally area code 0136148915 without any further ado we have some questions also that we received on my facebook page as well as the youtube channel and the various social media platform one of them suits uh, today's occasion which according to many of the historians coincides the birth of the greatest man ever walked the earth, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. From Hashim, Asadil is asking, Salaam Alaikum Shaykh, there is a lot of people celebrating the Mawlid, what should I do? Before answering this question, there are a few facts that we have to tackle. The first fact is that wealth of Rabi'u al-Awwal there is a general consensus among all historians is definitely the date of the death of Prophet Muhammad So we all agree that the Prophet died on the twelfth of Rabi'ul Awal. What about the birth of the Prophet We have two many different opinions. Not only concerning the date, but also concerning the month. Some believe it is the month of Rabi'ul Awal. Some historians said it is the following month, and some historians said, no, it was a Ramadan. And the year is the year of the elephant. The day there is a general consensus that the Prophet ﷺ was born on Monday. Consigning which date, we're not sure. Whether the second, whether the third, the eighth, the ninth, or the twelfth of Rabi' al-Awwal for those who say he was born on the month of Rabi' al-Awwal. So that means these are all different opinions. And you cannot say the twelfth of Rabi' al-Awwal is the most accurate because in fact, according to the calculations, what is more accurate is the ninth of Rabi' al-Awwal. And I'm sure those of you who have studied the seerah in the beautiful summary of Ar-Rahiq al maktum the seal nectar, by uh, Safi al-Rahman Mubarakafuri, may Allah have mercy on his soul. In the first, in the Muqaddimah, first few pages, he has mentioned that the Prophet Sallallahu was born most likely on the ninth of Rabi' al-Awwal. What do we understand out of that? A combination of all the previous references gives us an impression that not even the Prophet ﷺ knew exactly the date of his birth. Because back then, they used not to pay attention to that. But he knew that he was born on Monday, because that is stated in the hadith. In the sound hadith, an Nabi ﷺ said, On Monday I was born, and on one day, on Monday, unzila alayya fi, the beginning of the wahi started off on Monday when he was in the cave of Hira. So this is guaranteed. Agreed upon it. Why? Because the Nabi said so. What was the prophetic way of commemorating this day? It was simply a means of giving thanks to Allah by allowing him to be born on that day. So the Nabi used to fast on Mondays not on the twelfth, not once a year, but every Monday and every Thursday, if he was not Musafir, he's fasting. And he was asked why these two days, so he said for Monday, I was born on that day, so I give thanks to Allah. So if any Muslim wanted to come and read the remembrance of Allah, of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, not once a year. Follow his footsteps, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you love him so much, uh, you want to fast Mondays of every week, then you're really celebrating and commemorating the remembrance of the Prophet 
Nowadays and since the beginning of the month of Rabi'u al-Awwal, I myself in every Friday sermon, in every ta'aleem in class, I speak about the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, his birth, his mission. We were so lucky that we were chosen by Allah to film an entire program of 30 episodes talking about Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, his biography, and how he dealt with various kind of people. MashaAllah. So this is also a way of commemorating the remembrance of the Prophet ﷺ. What people do of beating the drums and dancing and singing songs, assuming that, MashaAllah, this is how we celebrate the birth of the Prophet ﷺ. I can assure you that has nothing to do with the Sunnah, that has nothing to do with the love of Prophet Muhammad whatsoever. Simply because neither him nor his loved ones have ever done so. Even under regular circumstances, this is not uh, something permissible. Those who dance and sing, we don't do that as Muslims, let alone doing it uh, to celebrate the birth of the Prophet ﷺ once a year on a date that is not confirmed. And no one on earth can come up and say, well, it's confirmed because the Prophet used to celebrate it, or Abu Bakr, or Umar, or even 124,000 companions, or even the following generation, or the following one. The Fatimites, who were outest sect of the Shia, and the Fatimites, by the way, who occupied Egypt and north of Africa, they were not Muslims. They were not only deviant uh, sect from Shia, or from Shiaism, because not all Shias are alike, but the Fatimites were pretty extreme. In a sense, يعني, look at the name, beautiful, who occupied Egypt, and Mu'iz, the one who gave dignity to the deen of Allah. Number one, they never belonged to the family of the Prophet ﷺ, but any occupation forces, in order to assure the occupied people that they belong to them, so they fabricated that. Napoleon, when he occupied Egypt, he went to Al-Azhar and he declared the Shahada, just to assure people I'm one of you, and he was a liar. You know, occupying forces to suck the blood and the wealth of the countries that they occupy. So anyway, the Fatimites were non-believers. Because this guy, besides claiming the prophethood, he claimed the lordship. Many people do not know that. Many people do not know, even Egyptians, that the very first Mawlid celebration was invented by the Fatimites, who kept the Egyptians busy and all the occupied territories in Africa with these celebrations and festivals, even to unknown personalities. So by the time they finish this Mawlid, there is another Mawlid, and there is another Mawlid, and there is a Mawlid, and there is a commemoration of the death, and so on and so forth. Up until this moment, you will find a very unique way of celebrating the Mawlid. Here in Egypt, for instance, they sell uh, you know, a bride or a doll made of sugar, and a horse, and a horseman also made of sugar, of very bad quality, terrible. It was invented also by the Fatimites. So simply, we as Muslims were required to think before we imitate and we copy. I claim that I love the Prophet ﷺ more than myself. And because of that, I try my best to propagate his message, to imitate him in his sunnah, in his way of living, in his way of dealing with others, in eating, in sleeping, in answering the call of nature, in uh, tahara, in the ibadat and the rituals, in the way I deal with my wife and my kids. By that, you truly love the Prophet ﷺ. You truly commemorate his remembrance, not once a year, on a date which is not uh, certain, rather throughout your life. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what is best. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tunnel from Germany. Thank you for waiting, Tunnel. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask Wada. Go ahead. 
I have two questions, Chase. My first question is, if I'm going home from work or from lectures, I'm setting up a uni, and I pray Asr, and after that, should I make the Ezkar? Or is it Your okay voice has faded, and... Tunnel. Can you raise your volume, please? Okay, I will repeat, inshallah. Um, after work, when I get home, and it's time to pray Asr, I'm praying at home, and I want to do my Ezkar. Is it okay if I, like, is it allowed or appropriate to do my eskar while cooking? Or should I sit and do nothing and just do my eskar after Asr? I understand from that you're a good cook, right? Yeah, I cook every day. I can assure <laughs> you that your food will taste very delicious because you'll be cooking while reciting eskar. And when my wife cooks a very good food and I say, MashaAllah, very delicious, she, she says, I cooked it with the eskar. I was reciting my eskar when I was cooking. So the answer is in the affirmative. Yes, it is permissible. Barakallahu feek. Tunnel from Germany. Your second question, please. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, yes. Your second question. The second, yeah, the second question is, are we like, allowed to go to solarium, like get a tan bath at the solarium? I'm sorry. Yeah, Tunnel, I didn't get your second question. Okay. Are we allowed to go into a solarium to get us 10 baths, like artificial 10 baths? I'm not aware of that. Would you please educate me further? Okay. Um, it's a place you go there and you get like a thumb bath. It's like electrical. It's not from the sun. Okay. Where you get brown on the whole, to get, skin, to on the whole body. To get tanned, you mean? Yeah, again, exactly, we get tanned. Okay, but provided you're not showing your aura to uh, non-mahram. It's closed, it's like a cabinet. Yeah, you're okay, not, nobody no, can see no, no problem. As long as it is not harmful, you're not showing your aura okay. before non-mahram, it is permissible, it's okay. Um, if, if, if you're talking about something similar to sauna, okay, that is permissible. And sauna itself is permissible, of course, provided you do not show your aura before others, okay? Your third question? Okay. Mayim from Romania. Assalamu alaikum, Sister Mariam. Welcome to Ask Oda. How can I help you, Mariam? Wa alaikum salam. I have one question. Yeah. Uh, when I pray Isha and uh, I stood up for second rakat yeah. and I start to to read Surah Al-Fatiha mm -hmm. but I'm not sure uh, I have doubts if I finish or not the old Surah okay do it so again what should I do? do it again or do it from wherever you remember you stopped at okay if you're not sure okay any other questions uh, Maya? do I ask you uh, yeah, only one. Do I have to make uh, 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 forgetfulness uh, sajita or no? Uh, no, no, you no, you don't have to. Okay, okay. okay. Thank, Thank you, you. Mariam from Romania. Assalamu alaikum. Muhammad from the Philippines. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hi, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah, Muhammad. Sheikh, I have two questions, Sheikh. Mm -hmm. So, first question, Sheikh, is, Sheikh, for example, if I'm a traveler and then I prayed in the masjid with the congregation, for example, the solar prayer, and then afterwards, can I change my position and pray, uh, shorten and combine the answer prayer, Sheikh? What is your question then? If you're traveling and you get to shorten your prayer and combine Dhuhr and As, Maghrib and Isha. Muhammad? Is it permissible, Sheikh, to combine and shorten my Asr prayer after praying Dhuhr in the congregation in the masjid? Oh, yes, it is permissible. That's a good question. Let's say that I'm Musafir and I attended the Dhuhr in congregation where the Imam is local, so he prayed four rakahs. When I enter the prayer, I premeditated or I have the niyyah that I'm going to soon after Dhuhr, I'm going to pray Asr, Jamma, combine Asr along with Dhuhr. In this case, if I come to pray by myself, 
I'll pray two rak'ahs. If somebody is praying the sunnah and I join him with the intention of praying asr, it counts as jama'ah too. He's praying sunnah two rak'ahs and you're praying asr two rak'ahs because you're a musafir. All of that is permissible. That's a very good question, Muhammad from the Philippines. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Nadia from Canada. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Ask with the Sister Nadia. Thank you, Sheikh. Uh, my question is about giving to zakat to a family member. I have a cousin. He's very uh, eligible to get the zakat. Mm. But uh, he's like, we are from um, uh, Sayyid family. So I'm just wondering. Is he eligible for the zakat? He's a, from Sayyid's family, but he really he needs the, the money in Afghanistan. Taib, thank you, Sister Nadia. If a person is proven to be a descendant of Prophet Muhammad or from Al Bayt al Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam, for certain, under regular circumstances, the Prophet peace be upon him and his family members aren't eligible for zakat. To the extent that when a Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasallam had uh, some dates in his house and his grandson Al Hassan picked up one and he poured it between his teeth and he was about to bite it, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam took it away from him and threw it back on the pile of dates and said, It is not permissible for the family of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam to eat our fit. And that is because the zakah is one of the means of purifying the wealth of people, of the Muslims. So it's not permissible to give the Prophet ﷺ or his family members from the wash off of the zakah or the wealth of people. Because also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala appointed al-anfal, one-fifth of al-anfal, lillahi wa lil-rasul. So the Messenger of Allah used not to take this money one-fifth of the ghanima for himself, but he would distribute it among the family members. But if we have now people who are from al bayt al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they are poor, they are masakeen, they are eligible, and no one is, uh, is supporting them. The state, the Muslim country, the ummah is not paying attention to them, neither verifying their credentials, nor giving them their due rights in this case if somebody is poor and he is desperately in need and I have some zakah I can give him out of the zakah so once again under regular circumstances no but if they're not receiving any fund or support or welfare from the Muslim state or from the assembly of al Bayt and Nabi and they are desperately in need in this case I may give them out of that Thank you, Sister Nadia from Canada. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Samia from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, Samia. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, sir. I am from Bangladesh. Okay. Welcome to Ask Wada, Samia. Sir, my question is can we cut our hair? Uh, one side and can we keep our hair longer than our side? Samia is asking can we cut our hair on one side and the question is not really clear if you mean that can we cut our hair so that it would reach the shoulder that is the side you mean or longer than that it is permissible for men to grow their hair and the Nabi had long hair and he made it into braids and it is permissible to cut your hair for women it's only permissible to cut their hair but not shorter than the shoulders while for men what is prohibited in respect of the haircut is al qaza which is to shave the sides of the head and to leave the top as a crown or a cap to shave the side or to fade it completely so that the upper part there is hair and on the sides there is no hair or there is very little hair 
this act is absolutely forbidden. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa naha anil qazza. Thank you, Samir from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sahib from Uzbekistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sahib. Can you hear me, Sahib? Tayyib, let's try again. Sahib, we lost that call. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Salim from the UK, welcome to ask Uda Salim. Yes, I would like to ask. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It's a pleasure to talk to, talk to you. Likewise, to Salim. To you, sir. Thank you. My question is, um, when Congress, Congregation Jama'a and, and the Imam, when, for example, bring Maghrib or Asha, and Imam has to recite the, the surah, and do I, have, um, do I have to recite with him, or, or I have to just to listen after the Fatiha? Do I have to recite the Fatiha after that, or I have to... Tayyip Salim, uh, that's a, a, a good question. It is repetitive, but it is important. Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, La salata liman lam yaqra' bi umm al-kitab. Umm al-kitab is Surah Al-Fatiha. It is called the mother of the book. And it is a pillar to recite Umm al-kitab, Al-Fatiha, in every single unit of the prayers, whether mandatory prayers or even voluntary prayers. And if a Muslim skipped the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha in any unit, then the whole prayer is invalid. In the case of the Imam, must recite it in every rak'ah. Some units you recite out loud, like in Fajr, the two rak'ahs, Maghrib and Isha, the first two rak'ahs of Maghrib and the first two units of Isha. And then in the remaining rak'ahs, everyone recites, but quietly not loud recitation. So the Ma'moom, the follower, likewise, should recite Surah Al-Fatiha on his or her own after the Imam. But we have two cases. One of them is when the Imam is known of leaving a gap between the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha and the following Surah. In this case, I say Ameen and I immediately recite Surah Al-Fatiha. I should so do so. If the Imam is one of those who finishes Surah Al-Fatiha and immediately recites the other Surah, which is not the Sunnah, then I should be listening quietly because Allah the Almighty says, وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ وَإِذَا قُرِئَ الْقُرْآنُ فَاسْتَمِعُونَهُ وَأَنصِتُوا لَعَلَّكُمْ تُرْحَمُونَ Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said this ayah which means whenever the Quran is recited, استمعوا, listen attentively. أنصتوا, be quiet. لعلكم ترحمون, in order to be eligible for Allah's mercy. He said that is concerning the Quran that is being recited in the prayer. May Allah guide us to what is best. But if you're praying by yourself in every single unit, you should recite Surah Al-Fatiha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mahboob from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum, brother Mahboob. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. How are you, doctor? Welcome to Ask Huda. I'm doing fine. Alhamdulillah. And you? Alhamdulillah. I have two questions. No. One is, uh, uh, are there any virtues of dying on a Monday? And uh, my second question is, uh, suppose there's a person who is ignorant and uh, makes fun of uh, Islamic principles. And I ask people, uh, is this guy even a Muslim? So is this considered to be giving takfir or is, is, is it not? Thank you. Barakallah feek. The first question, the verses concerning dying on Friday or its night, which begins at sunset on Thursday. Keep it in mind, any verses that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, talk about is only for people who were righteous. If somebody was either non-Muslim or a non-practicing Muslim, somebody who is not to pray, and he died on Laylatul Qadr, it would not do him any good because he's a loser anyway. But a person 
who was righteous and he died on Friday, that's a good sign. And Allah will protect him from the torment of the grave and etc. Things of this nature. The virtues only apply for the righteous people, not the wicked ones. May Allah make us all among the righteous ones. When somebody is committing a sin, even if the sin is perceived to be such a major sin, but it is not shirk then I'm neither allowed to say he's a mushrik or a kafir or even ask the rhetoric question, is he even a Muslim? Because it is hinting that I'm doubting his Islam. And it is not permissible because the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, whoever says to his Muslim brother, Ya kafir, you are a kafir, then فَقَدْ بَاءَ بِهَا أَحَدُهُمَا Then one of whom is actually a disbeliever. Either the one whom you accuse with kufr is literally kafir, or if he's not, then you've committed an act of disbelief because you appointed yourself as a judge instead of Allah. So be very careful. The matter of judging people with disbelief is only concerning the committees of fatwas, the state itself, judiciary system. When they decide this person have committed an act of shirk or is insisting on denying what is necessarily known for every Muslim to be part of Aqeedah. So I would distance myself from even hinting or giving a question which the audience may figure out from that you are doubting the Islam of this person. Allah knows best. Assalamu alaikum. Well, it's a break time, so brothers and sisters will take a short break and inshallah we'll be back in a few minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, my dear viewers, welcome back. Um, I'm sure you'll be able to locate our phone numbers and the contact informations on the bottom of your screen. So feel free to contact any of the following numbers should you have any questions, inshallah. We have some callers already. Assalamu alaikum. Sidi from Germany. Assalamu alaikum. Barakatuh, Sheikh, how are you? I'm doing great, Alhamdulillah, and you? Alhamdulillah, Barak Lavik. Um, Sheikh, my question is, um, can we um, repeat the words and the sentence in Tashahud in, in Salatul Ibrahim? Or will, will it uh, invalid the prayer if we do that? Why would you repeat them? Uh, because of the um, uh, difficulty in um, speaking Arabic, for example. So okay. i afraid that if I don't recite it, Clearly, I would I would, would invent the prayer. That's why I repeat the words. It is permissible. Yes, indeed. Okay. Okay. For okay. that purpose, for that purpose, it is permissible. Thank you, Sidi. May Allah make it easy for you and bless you and your family. Abdul Musawwir from Germany. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Uh, I, ha I have a question. Uh, I have uh, asked time, uh, one time, but I uh, didn't uh, understand the uh, real answer because I said uh, when when my friend, like he is not Muslim, when he go to with me shopping and I know that he uh, buy uh, also alcohol. Uh, and another things and also uh, alcohol sometimes when he, when i take him to shopping uh, it is allowed or no it is not allowed uh, it is not allowed no so the answer is very simple if i know this friend of mine i'm going to help him pick him up give him a right to buy alcohol this is not permissible as why mm -hmm. as why because the Almighty Allah said in Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ You should not help nor assist those who are doing anything which is categorized as a sin or a transgression. If I know beforehand this person, he's my friend. 
he's going to buy drugs. I'm just giving him a ride. That's not permissible. He picked up a girl and he's going to a hotel room where he would commit adultery. I know that for sure. It's not permissible. Okay? Versus when I pick up a random passenger. I'm a cab driver. I don't know whether she's his wife or not. It's not my responsibility. He just came out of the grocery store. He said, taxi. I'm a driver. So I picked him up. He ordered Uber. And I'm a captain on Uber. I picked him up. I don't know what is concealed in the shopping bags. Then this is none of my business. It's permissible. A friend of mine said, hey, let's go to this shop or convenience store. I want to buy some... Uh, Alcohol or beer, no, that is not permissible because you know that you'll be involved in that. Barakallah feek, Abdul Musawwar from Germany. Assalamu alaikum. Khadija from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I have one question. Mm. Okay, my question is, uh, please, can you give me the explanation of the verse that says, Azwajukum wa awladukum fitna? Okay. Jazakallah khair. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, I believe this is Surah Al-Taghabun. A'lamu annama amwalukum wa awladukum fitna. If we have the verse, we can show it on the screen. I would appreciate that. Maybe we'll be able to fetch it out and display it, inshallah. And it means that you got to understand and acknowledge the fact that your wealth and your children are all means of trials and tests. So if a person utilizes his wealth, which he has earned from lawful sources, and he spent it on lawful sources and he recognized the rights of the poor, the relatives and the arms of Allah in it. Then he passed the test and he will be rewarded. Awladukum, your children, boys or girls. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited this ayah when he was given the khutbah on Friday. And then he saw uh, one of his grandsons or both of them, Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, actually both of them. And they dressed up in a, in a nice thawb and it was red, but it was kind of uh, tall or oversized and they were being toppled, tripled in their clothes. So Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam interrupted his speech. He came down, he went all the way, he picked them up and uh, he climbed the pulpit again and he revived uh, and he resumed the khutbah and he said alamu annama amwalukum wa awladukum fitna wa anna allah indahu ajrun azim know that your uh, uh, I think this ayah is of surah al-anfal we'll try to take it out inshallah but there is another ayah min azwajikum wa awladikum aadu wa lakum fah zaruhum this is the ayah of surah al-taghabun which warns against Having a spouse or a child who is not a believer or who is not practicing and is trying to hinder you from the path of Allah. And this ayah was revealed concerning those who slowed down on performing hijrah. They didn't migrate along with the Prophet ﷺ because their wives and their children. Ya ayyuhaladina amanu inna min azwajikum. وَأَوْلَادِكُمْ عَدُوًّا لَكُمْ فَحْذَرُوهُمْ So when they migrated, Surah Al-Tawabun, chapter number 64, ayah number 14. So when they migrated, that they blamed it on their spouses, on their children, because you delayed us from the hijrah, and you were, you were, you were the, the main reason. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, as long as they have repented, وَإِن تَعْفُوا وَتَصْفَحُوا وَتَغْفِرُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ if you pardon and forgive and let go, then Allah indeed is of forgiving, most merciful. But the other ayah, is also Surah Al-Anfal. Thank you. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum.
محمود from the UK السلام عليكم عليكم السلام شيك نعم so, um, in my office um, I am the only person who is praying right now mm. and um, the problem that I face sometimes is um, so we have a common washroom so where when I go and perform wudu sometimes by mistake or fortunately unfortunately I spill some water in the washroom and um, I just sometimes feel it is a bit uncomfortable for my other colleague so my question is um, in this case is it okay for me to do the tayammum and uh, instead of um, using the water and do my wudu mm -hmm. and if it is air uh, I can do the tayammum what is the right it way Akhi Mahmoud thank you for asking this question it is simply our fault that we exaggerate <clears throat> we're being extravagant whenever we make wudu and Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to make wudu maybe with a handful of water so basically if you're wearing socks and you put them on after making wudu in the morning alhamdulillah so this way you don't have to worry about washing your feet which means washing the hands washing the face your colleagues non-muslims everybody does the same you know we go to the washroom and in the sink we wash our faces everybody does whether muslims or non-muslims what is left washing your arms up to the elbows i don't think that would spill water all around so being moderate in making wudu would secure that you will not spill water around and if you do simply either you, there are towels around you paper towels and you make sure that you you dry up behind you even when i'm in the, in the plane and i use the bathroom which is little tight and i make wudu every time i make certain to clean up the mess after me so if there is any water that is spilled especially from the elbows i dry it up so that the person would walk after me would uh, would appreciate that or at least would not criticize that and I will be standing and praying before people. Thank you, Mahmoud. But it is not permissible to make tayammum for this reason because you already have wudu. Put your socks on ala tahara after you make wudu in the morning. When you come to the office and you have to make wudu, like everyone else, wash your hands and the face uh, in the sink. And if there is any spill water, dry it up. Thank you, Brother Mahmoud. Assalamu alaikum. Abdullah from Egypt. Assalamu alaikum. Abdullah. How do how do you share? Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah. How are you? Okay. Uh, I cannot hear you, Abdullah. Sh shall I go into my question, sir? Please go ahead. Yeah. What happened is I I uh, I was born as a Muslim, but uh, I used to live in the United States. So uh, I came, uh, became uh, adherent there to the Sunnah for a long, for a long time. Then when I started to uh, seek knowledge, I didn't know in the beginning which which uh, kind of, what kind of knowledge is obligatory and which uh, which is uh, to be uh, uh, not, not not important. So I want you to clarify which uh, which uh, what kind of knowledge is the one who is supposed to be obligatory. Thank you very much. I understand you're calling from Egypt as well, Abdullah. Yes, yes, I'm, 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 I'm doing that. I'm from Egypt. You're in Egypt. Okay, you're in Egypt now. Okay. Do you know Arabic or you only know English? Yeah, yeah uh, I'm bilingual. Okay, so in this case, if I advise you with Arabic books, you'll be able to read them, correct? Uh, for sure, but, you know, it's, it's the same, you know what I'm saying? Okay, now I advise you, my respected brother, since you are in Egypt, you check out if there is any nearby imam so that you would hire him as a private tutor. An hour every day or two hours, whatever you can afford. It will not be much, maybe a hundred bucks for a whole month, 200 bucks, which is nothing. If you go to Red Lobster and dine, that's it, Fridays, that's it. So you can hire the private tutor for a whole month where the following books are, high, are highly recommend. Number one, I recommend that he teaches you how to read Quran because this is essential. And also, since you're bilingual, alhamdulillah, that will make it easier for you to understand and comprehend what you read of the Qur'an and memorize the simple surahs that you can recite in your prayers. Along with knowing their meaning. 
There is a beautiful book which is called Minhajul Muslim and Aqidatul Mu'min, these two books for uh, Sheikh Abu Bakr Jabir Al Jazairi, may Allah have mercy on him, who was teaching in Al Haram al Nabawi, the Masjid of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, until recent. Then he died when he was over 90, mashallah. So his books are very comprehensive, two volumes. Seerah, I would recommend for you to read uh, Al Rahiq al Makhtoum. Or there is a series of seerah in Arabic and in English translated to English by Dr. Ali al Sallabi. Sheikh Muhammad al Ghazali has a book which is called Fiqh of Seerah. And I consider studying the seerah of the Prophet وسلم, equally important to knowing the meaning of the Quran and to studying Aqidah. Okay? When you do that, then the book of the 40 Nawawi Hadith. Imam Yahya ibn Sharaf al Nawawi, whom we are studying his book for the past 650 episodes. Yani, MashaAllah, by the grace of Allah, over 10 years, 650 hours, we've been explaining the book of Riyadh al Salihin. He has another collection, but without sharh, it's known as Al Arba'un al Nawawiya. One of the best commentators of the 40 Nawaw hadith, and he made them even 50 is Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali, may Allah have mercy on him. One volume. If you drive or if you go to Al-Azhar area, there are a couple of uh, bookstores, Darus Salam, whether the Egyptian or Saudi Darus Salam publications. And uh, I highly recommend the uh, Saudi one because their English translation is much more accurate. Okay, I do not work for neither one of them, but just giving you an advice. You buy these books, Riyadh al-Salihi, the 40 Nawawi Hadith, uh, and Minhaju al-Muslim, Aqidat al-Mu'min, and Bismillah, may Allah make it easy for you. When you finish them, let me know, inshallah, I'll be more than happy to walk you through. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ummu Salih from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Ummu Salih, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. And you, Sheikh? Doing great, alhamdulillah. Yeah, I have two questions. One is kind of advice and one is a question. Mm -hmm. And my first question is, you know when you read the du'as, the night du'as, like Ayatul Kursi, Falah for your child, mm -hmm. and you blow away on them, mm -hmm. Do you, and I would want to do it the same to myself. But do I need to read it again or can I just do it for both of us? That's a good question. And what about if you and do it again? What, you know, I'd, it's not going to be too much. I mean, it's not too much. I'm just asking. I understand. Sometimes basically we sleep in the same room and then I do fall asleep. So I just thought. If you do this and you wipe over yourself and over your baby, it is perfectly fine. And if you have the capacity to recite it for yourself independently, then for your child, it is even better. Okay, Umm Saleh? Okay. Sister Fatima from the USA, welcome to Ask Huda. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Go ahead. I have two questions. The mm -hmm. first question is, uh, uh, are you obligated to ask permission when you are on a waiting period? And is, are you are you are you uh, responsible or sinful if you don't ask a permission and you go out or you go do your your basic things? And the second one is. Uh, uh, I listened to your speech yesterday about riba. Uh, is it uh, taking a car loan? Is it considered as a riba? And uh, if you like, they ask you to pay a certain amount of money within five years, and after, uh, then when you decide to pay it earlier, like say if you pay in three years, you will not pay the interest. If you pay it in five years, mm. you may pay you may pay the interest. Sister Fatima, with regards to your first question, the waiting period for divorce or death, a widow or a divorcee? 
divorce. Divorce. Okay. Thank you. So now the question is clearer. A waiting period, a woman who's divorced, according to what Allah said in Surah Al Talaq. يا أيها النبي إذا طلقتم النساء فطلقوهن لعدتهن وأحصوا العدة واتقوا الله ربكم لا تخرجوهن من بيوتهن ولا يخرجن ولا يخرجن إلا أن يأتين بفاحشة مبينة. According to this ayah. Allah the Almighty commanded لا تخرجوهن من بيوتهن You should not ask them to leave their houses which they were living in with their husbands. So after you divorce your wife you do not ask her to leave or to go to her parents house. She must pin the idda in the same house with you. ولا يخرجنا And it is not permissible for them to leave unless if they have committed an obvious illicit relationship or illicit act. So that means when you're still in the idda, you are like a married woman. So whatever used to apply before, like if you're normally going to school every morning and your husband is okay with that. If you're a working woman to teach, to do whatever, and every morning you even come back afternoon, so now I'm applying what Allah said in Surah Al-Talaq and my husband is on the same page, we're both righteous. So I stay in my room and he's staying in his room and I spend the idda three period, three months. So I go and I come back as I used to do before. I go shopping, I go for hair, whatever. But if there are things that I have to do like traveling or moving, then I have to inform this guy because this is what Allah said لا تخرجوهن من بيوتهن ولا يخرجن إلا أن يأتينا بفاحشة مبينة then he followed that by saying وتلك حدود الله those are the boundaries of Allah do not cross them and whoever crosses them has indeed wronged himself your second question is buying a car with a loan from the bank. Sister Fatima from the USA is asking, is this considered riba? Let me break it down and make it very simple for you. If any item you buy it from the seller and it is financed by the seller and the contract does not discuss interest, rather he says, I normally sell this car for 15 grands for those who pay cash or if the bank pays me but if you want me to finance it he made his math and he said for three years I would charge you 18,000 instead of 15 I said Bismillah and we concluded the contract I bought a Honda for 15,000 and basically I will pay 18,000 in three years, we'll break it down on installments. Is this permissible? 100% permissible. And that is what is known as al bayu bisi'rayni. So if it is financed by owner, and he gave you a different price based on the fact that it will be on an installment, it is permissible. But once we have a third party, my respected sister, which is the bank, what does the bank do? It gives a loan. And for that, he gives a loan he pays the owner, which is the car dealer, like the mortgage of the houses. So the seller is done and he collected the price. And now you got to pay the bank with interest. It's a loan with interest that is not permissible. And this is pure usury. May Allah guide us what is best. And by that, we've come to the end of today's edition of Ask Huda. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. 
Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the ultimate test. Help me in my quest. Permit me to pass the ultimate test. Allah is my heart's speech. Your mercy is what I beseech. Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen 